uh, when we come to the house of God. And uh, let's give him all the glory, honor, and praise. And so, and uh, also, Brother uh, Kuhn was telling me, he said, 51 years ago today, he joined this church. And uh, what an amazing testimony that is. And uh, praise the Lord. Brother Dwight, I know you pray for the Sunday school hour, but uh, would you mind praying again to open us up in a word of prayer? Amen. All right, just a few announcements here. Of course, the Valentine's dinner is uh, coming up, and so that's going to be February 11th. And then we have our evangelist, Chris Miller. He'll be here for the week of the 12th to the 15th, and I've uh, uh, been in touch with him, talking with him, and trying to prepare for the, for the meeting. And uh, so, again, you know, like I said, prepare your hearts. Be praying for the preacher, and uh, also just pray about being here. I don't think you have to do much praying about that, but uh, we ought to be here, so... February 12th to the 15th, I know it says the 25th, but uh, it's the 15th, uh, that would be a long revival meeting right there, so uh, next Sunday there, so February the 28th, we have the ladies Bible study, and uh, so all that's uh, there in your announcements, so let us go ahead and get into our song service for this morning, you got your hymn books, we're going to turn to hymn number 237, 237, The Cleansing Wave, and I invite you to set up a, a CD in our car. And uh, as Hunter Conkle and uh, uh, Morgan Edwards, and they sing this song, and it's beautiful. The two guys I went to uh, Bible college with, and uh, godly men, thankful for them and their ministries. And it just puts me in mind of that, and also the Lord as well. We're getting ready for our offertory, and uh, just thankful for uh, the opportunity to give unto the Lord. We give because it's the right thing to do, and because the Lord desires it, and uh, it also helps uh, keep the lights on and things of that nature, and uh, but, uh, you know, I hope you've asked the Lord about, how, you know, what the Lord wants you to give uh, for for the day, and so let's pray for the offering, and I'm going to have uh, Brother Tommy, would you mind praying for the offering?
I'm getting better and better all the time, but uh, you know, it takes a lot of practice. She, she tells me that the piano teacher's really trying her, so uh, in a good way, that is, you know, stretching out the fingers and uh, all that piano practice stuff. I wish I knew how to play, you know. Uh, as I think about uh, uh, this next hymn that's coming up here, I wish I'd given it more. I tell you, uh, there's not a harder hymn for me to sing than this one, you know, because it's very just pours at your heart. You're like, Lord, you know, that song, I wish I'd given them more, but uh, I think it's a, a desire of all of our hearts, and, and may it be more than a desire, but something that we actually do. Uh, let us give God our best. Let us give God more. <laughs> he deserves it all. We are to present our bodies a living sacrifice unto the Lord. So let's stand to your feet, if you will. Hymn number 400, I wish I had given him more. 400. Thank you for that. You could be seated there. Well, praise the Lord. We come together thankful for my boys. They've been behaving themselves unsupervised in a way, you know, uh, sitting by themselves, proud of them for that. And I uh, want to let Brother Willis come up. He has a, uh, another prophecy point before we get into our message. I guess everybody has seen or heard about the big balloon by now. That was the first thing that was on the news this morning when I turned it on. And, you know, it's hard to believe that China could be so stupid that they'd send something like that, let it go over our country, uh, and not know that we're going to shoot it down. And it came down right off the coast here of South Carolina. When I turned it on the news this morning, the trailer on the bottom of it mentioned that, and right above it, it described exactly what Jesus talked about in Matthew 24, 7. Rising tensions. Two words. Rising tensions. And I don't know if they're trying to provoke us over uh, Taiwan or what it is that's going on there, but that's going to continue to increase as the years go by. But, you know, talking about rising tensions, it's rising right here in America. 
I don't know how five police officers could be so stupid as to kill a young man like they did down in Memphis. The only saving grace about that is the fact that they were black instead of white. If they'd been white police officers, we'd probably be having riots all over America right now. But rising tensions in America. James chapter 5 talks about rich men hoarding their gold and storing it up for the last days. I watch the gold market. Don't own any gold. Maybe I got a gold tooth, but uh, don't really own any gold. But the price of gold has gone astronomically high in the last five years or so. It went over 1,900 an ounce just the other day. It's been going up and down some, and it'll bobble up and down like uh, 10 or $15 at a time. But anyway, rich men hoarding their gold, and I don't know that we've ever known a time in the history of the world when there's been so many rich men hoarding up their their wealth, and that's what they're doing. Talking about perilous times, 2 Timothy chapter 3, just like uh, the five black policemen. I can't believe that this shooting down in Walterboro is getting so much publicity. I mean, the national news, it's on the national news every night besides the local news. It's going everywhere about that. And I don't know what's so special about that shooting down there, but it is astonishing how much of that stuff goes on in the world this day and time. And I told you, for this month, the month of January, we're averaging almost two shootings per day. Two shootings per day. Something else that disgusts me to death 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, talking about the falling away. You know, Jesus said, when you return to this earth, will you find faith on the earth? I look at all the television preachers from time to time a little bit. I just like to know what's going on, what they're doing. It disgusts me no end to see preachers get up on television dressed in just about rags. This fellow, Stephen Furtick, I've looked at him several times, and I'm not kidding you. He's got a big mega church, hundreds, maybe thousands. I don't know how many he's got, but it's one of the big mega churches. Honest to goodness, he had on clothes. The last time I looked at him, did I throw in a trash can? Had on blue jeans that were ripped out in the knees. He had on a denim jacket or shirt where the collar was torn off of it and ragged threads. And I sit there and I look at a preacher like that, And I think, does he not have any respect for God Almighty? Does he think his position is less than the position of a local weatherman on television that wears a coat and tie? Joel Osteen, I'll say one thing about him. He knows how to dress, but he's nothing but pure cotton candy. He's as sweet as can be, but you couldn't grow spiritual on anything that he says. And there's another pastor, I won't give his name, that I've watched him for a number of years, and he used to always wear a coat and tie every time I saw him. And then the tie went. And then the coat went. And one time I saw him on there, I was like, I can't believe it. This guy just dressed like a clown. It looked horrible the way he was dressed. These are representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says men will have uh, turn, be turned away unto fables. They'll have itching ears wanting to hear people You know, they'll tell them what they want to hear. And I lay a lot of this at the feet of Rick Warren. He's the one that started all this mess, you know. Just come as you are to church any way that you want to. Well, you know, a lot of our folks dress casual in here, and I've got nothing wrong with that. But for a preacher that's to be the representative of God Almighty, to stand up in the pulpit, to preach the Bible, and dress like some of them dress this day and time, it just disgusts me no end. That's all I'll mention today. <laughs> I've got a few more. I'm telling you, so many things are happening, it's just hard to talk about all of them at one time. But keep looking up. Jesus is coming. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, brother. All right. Give me two praises, and we'll get started into this sermon. I need two praises. Yes, sir. Roberto. Amen. Yeah, that, that was a good time. Really enjoyed that. Give me, give me another praise. Yes, sir, brother Brian. Yeah, Amen. I, I tried to get him to come to church here, but he says I live in Spartansburg. I said, Oh, okay. I said that'd be quite a drive. Brother Willis, I saw your hand.
Yeah, be in prayer for Miss Ann. Yeah, amen. It's it's not easy to get a doctor's appointment anymore. Other than Miss Bonnie, she's the quickest I've ever seen do it. You know, she's had a CAT scan, a knee surgery, and all that, all within a week time. I don't know how she did that. She knows somebody. <laughs> Anyway, let's, uh, let's get into the Word of God this morning. Take your Bibles and go over to Matthew chapter 11. I uh, hope you appreciated Sunday school this morning, a message of comfort out of Isaiah chapter 40, uh, verses 1 through 11 over there. There was a message on comfort. But now we're over in Matthew chapter 11. I had I've been thinking about those two passages um, indirectly, coincidentally, you know, um, or messages I've heard preached both times, both by uh, Pastor Sarah and I, both uh, we highly respect. Not not the same message, you know, I, but uh, anyway, I, I heard him in recent time, I guess, preaching those two passages, and uh, Pastor Norman Johnson, who's now with the Lord, and a uh, very man that I respect highly. But uh, this message I've entitled Unburdened, and uh, so Matthew chapter 11, we'll look at verses 25 through 30. Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 through 30. It says in verse 25, At the time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Um, essentially, well, he'll tell you what that is. It's the revelation of himself. All the way from Matthew chapter 11, verse 1, all the way down to this point in time, it was God revealing himself, Christ revealing himself um, through there. It says, verse 26, even so, Father, for so it seemeth good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father. No man knoweth the Son, but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son. And he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. And here's the favorite passage that many people turn to, and uh, it's become a favorite to many. It says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. You shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And with that, we'll pray before we get into the Word of God this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your Word. May you help us to understand, Lord, that we may apply it to our lives. I believe that there's a lot of burdens that are being carried in our day and age that we don't necessarily have to carry. Lord, I pray that you would just um, give us complete understanding of your word. May you comfort our hearts. May you just help us to walk in the light of your word and to draw near unto you. Lord, just help us to understand what it means to, again, like I preached last week in John 15, to abide in the vine. Lord, I believe that there's so many people that are trying to do everything their own way. But, Lord, what we need to do is to come unto you. Help us to come unto you today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. When I was, again, I uh, had mentioned a little bit of this toward the end of my Sunday school lesson, uh, but when I first got saved, I was, uh, you know, there within the, the, the prison ministry there. I was uh, singing in the choir. I was the only white guy in an all-black choir, and uh, so you can imagine the kind of songs that we sung, a lot of them spiritual songs is what they would call them. And uh, just has this great, profound meaning. I don't know if you ever had listened to that kind of music before, but it's very moving and stirring. It has a lot to do with uh, the, you know, back in the time, way back when, of course, our country's come a long way, and I believe we're facing some setbacks right now. It's, it's unfortunate. But back in the day and age where there was slavery and there was hardships and there was toil and trouble and trial, they would come up with these uh, powerful songs that they would sing but it, w- it wouldn't be the kind that you would imagine. It was just, it seemed like have a, a strong faith, a fervency, a, uh, a, a zeal for revival, if you will. You know, we would sing songs, uh, uh, some of them seemed not so revivalistic, if I could say that word. You know, like wade in the water. But um, one of these songs was, uh, I, I laid my burden down. It went something like this. Glory, glory, hallelujah, since I laid my burden down. 
Glory, glory, hallelujah, since I laid my burden down. It had all kinds of lines to it. I feel better, so much better. I have peace like a river. I can't believe I'm singing this to you, okay? <laughs> but anyway, the whole point of it was, was they, they were carrying all kinds of, of, of burdens, and they, 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 they just had this sense of, of relief. Why? Because they had Jesus, and they had come unto them. They had laid down their burdens, and this is exactly what God is calling us to do, to lay down our burdens at his feet. It would be similar to have, I actually have two copies. I have an older copy of Pilgrim's Progress and a newer updated version of Pilgrim's Progress, kind of changes here and there, but uh, there in Pilgrim's Progress, I forget what chapter it is. In my book, it's verse, ch page 32, the one that I like to read. It uh, has the old pictures in it, you know. <laughs> but uh, it talks about Pilgrim. And Pilgrim was carrying all these burdens with him. And it wasn't until he came to the cross of Calvary, the place of deliverance, where he felt like all those burdens were lifted up off of him. They were moved off of his shoulders and the burden was representative of everything that you might imagine to be uh, the cares, the worries of the world, the, uh, you know, some of the things that he was faced with. Of course, if you read the story, it was, he was mocked by his own family. He was just left by all these uh, guys that came across his path, and he was just all alone there. Um, struggling again, you know, when we think about the song, the, the struggles of issues like uh, justice and freedom and uh, spiritual wholeness, if we think about Pilgrim's Progress itself, maybe uh, worries, ailments, finances, families, he went to the place called Vanity Fair, maybe those could be burdens, I, I don't know, but whatever the burden is, many of you, you know what those burdens are, you, you carry burdens, you, you have names for them, right, sometimes it's a family member, every time I talk to Miss Jerry Slater, she, she would tell me, she says, please pray, my granddaughter, Victoria, Please pray for my children. She has names for, for things she, she's carrying, you know, a desire to see her children in church. You know, she wants to be here herself. Uh, physical health has kind of stood in the way at this point in time. And you know what those burdens are for you. I don't know exactly all the time what some of those burdens are for Brother Willis. I know it's the care of his wife and taking care of Miss Ann Willis. And these burdens sometimes can be very great in our lives. I like the way that the poem of Pilgrim's Progress, uh, you, you come down to the very next page in my book. <laughs> um, I, li I like it better than the newer version as in the older version. So I'll give you the newer version of the poem that's there. Thus far I did come, burdened with my sin, nor could I find relief from my grief within. Until here I came, what a place this is. Here should be the beginning of full eternal bliss. And now my burden falls from my back forever from the cords that bound it. By grace, my grief is severed. Blessed cross, blessed tomb. I mean, it doesn't do any good to stop at the cross. There is an empty tomb, right? Rather, most blessed be the man there was put to shame, a shame that he took for me. And because of that, uh, Pilgrim felt unburdened from these loads he were carrying. And I asked the question to you, what burdens are you carrying? What burdens do you have this morning? What burdens do you uh, carry that don't have to be yours? There's a lot of different ways in which people try to unburden themselves. And to be truthful with you, sometimes they'll, they'll say, you know, they'll, they'll try to find it in a 12-step you know, a, a program or a 7-step program, 5-step program, 3-step program. They'll go to all these uh, uh, things. You know, if I go to Alcoholics Anonymous or, or what have you, they'll, they'll try to find all these ways. Sometimes they turn it around. Sometimes they'll try the bottle. Uh, sometimes they'll try other things, and it just doesn't seem to be any, any relief. Why? Because they're not going to Christ. And they don't know how to deal with the pressures, and they don't know how to deal with the burdens. And thank God that he gives us an answer. Christ says, come unto me. That's the only answer that works, because we'll never have rest until we do. They could be burdens of ministry and other things, but we must respond to the invitation of Christ to come unto me. Similar uh, passage of Scripture, as I was reading down through Isaiah chapter 40, at the end of Isaiah chapter 40 comes that well-familiar 
passages of Scripture, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. As this passage kind of has that same sort of mindset to wait upon the Lord, to, to come unto the Lord, to be uh, strengthened. Why? Because the Lord helps us to bear that load. He helps us to, to in the midst of, of the circumstances, in the midst of the trials, that's what I want you to understand. Let me give you what I believe to be the context of this passage. The command and uh, what I, I believe to be the, um, well, let me, let me just back up and say this. Verse 28 starts out with this, come unto me. And so if we want to look at a context for the passage of Scripture that we were trying to understand, what, what does it mean to come unto him? Well, we have to look at those who were coming unto Jesus. We have to look at those who are, who are making their way unto him. And we begin chapter 11 with what? With John the Baptist, a man who said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And we think to ourselves, why, why is John coming to Jesus? Well, at least he can't come. His disciples are coming. And the fact of the matter, he is discouraged because he, he had been in the ministry so long. He had been baptizing. He had been preparing the way of the Lord he says in, at the beginning when they ask him, who art thou? He says, I'm just a voice in the wilderness is what he says about himself. And he has his disciples. And, yes, he does make some claims where he says, you know, he must increase and I must decrease. But now he's at the point of life where it seems like what he imagined, it wasn't, it wasn't what he thought, Miss Joyce. This was not how it was supposed to be for him. He wasn't supposed to be in prison. And he thought to himself, is he really the Christ? He gathers his disciples around him and he says, guys, I, I, need, I need help. Would you please go back and ask Jesus? You, you ask him this and he'll understand. Just ask him the simple question, are you, are you the Christ? Are you he which should come? Essentially what happens is John the Baptist brings all of his doubts unto the Lord. And can I tell you this? I, I know because of your human nature, just like me, okay? You've had your doubts, just like John the Baptist had. But John the Baptist, can I say this? John the Baptist brought all of his doubts to the one who had the answers. He said, are you he which should come? So we look at those who are coming to Christ, number one, we look at John the Baptist He's coming with his doubts. Then he begins, John, to Jesus as only he can. He, he wants to give John the Baptist proof. Proof which John could imagine. He, John was a man of the scriptures. He knew the scriptures. He knew them through and through. And so what Jesus does, he doesn't go and give them a straight answer. He doesn't go out and say, well, just tell them I, I am I'm a Christ. Now, what does he do? There are people who are gathered unto him, and he begins to do all these miracles before him. Let me back up to the scriptures here. It says in, in uh, verse 4, it says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. Blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. I once heard uh, Paul Swanky preach through this passage. It sounds better coming out of his mouth than mine. But anyway, um, essentially there, there are, besides John, his disciples coming and bringing the doubts to Jesus, there are a multitude, a multitude a multitude of people were coming unto Jesus. Why? Because nobody is giving them help. You, you look through all the scriptures. John chapter 4, the woman at the well. I mean, she's coming up at a, at a noon time, a time where nobody's going to be there, and she's coming up. Wasn't expecting Jesus. But there she found a Messiah. John chapter 5, we see a man laid by the pool of Bethsaida, impotent, can't do anything. And when the waters are stirred, he's, he can't seem to get down into the waters because it was in the mindset, if I get down into the waters first, I'll be healed. And 
You saw everybody. It seemed like everybody else was getting the miracles, but not him. Nobody was helping him, and Jesus comes by the way. And he changed his whole life. He says, may thou be, you know, do you have any man? No man, Lord. May thou be made, you know, rise, take up thy bed and walk, and he does. Changed his entire life. John chapter 9, he sees this man as he's walking by, and it's a lesson unto his disciples. He sees this man that was born blind, and he heals him. Well, they, they, the disciples were all asking. It was a common thing back in the Jews' day. They thought that because he was blind, it was because of sin. Was it because of him, or was it because of his parents? That would have been the theological question back in that day and age. None, but that the works of God may be made manifest in him. And so you see these multitudes, something that the religious leaders wouldn't do anything. I mean, they wouldn't help. They wouldn't, they wouldn't do anything to lift a finger. I mean, they would talk about the law. Yes, they, they would go out and lift up the law. Oh, we're, we're keeping the law. We'll pray for you. But you get there's a reason why you're in poverty. There's a reason why you're broken. There's a reason why you don't feel good. And the reason why, in, in their minds, they say it's because of sin. That's why you're going through what you're going through. But us, we're blessed. We have God on our side. And I mean, it was God had never said those things. Jesus, the God of the Bible, was so gentle for those who were strangers and those who were the outcast, he had a heart for those kind of people, but it's what Israel had missed out, the religious leaders had missed out on at that point in time. And so they're coming unto Jesus. Why? That they might be healed. It was kind of this mindset, and, you know, does God really care about me? Surely you have those thoughts. Does God really love me? Will he really accept me, a person who is broken? They come to Jesus with all their difficulties. You see the, the alliteration there, John coming with his doubts. The multitudes that were there coming with their difficulties. Is anything too hard for God? No, he answers them. But in answering the difficulties, he also answers John's question. Well, what about the disciples, Jesus' disciples? I mean, Matthew 10, I mean, they... they they, they had been out in the highways and byways just going out and proclaiming the, 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 the gospel message. They were talking about Jesus. They, I mean, they came back rejoicing about how they had power over the spirits and you know, just the things that happened. Rejoice not that you have power over the, the, the spirits, but rejoice that your name is recorded in heaven. But I tell you, they, they, as long as they were with Jesus, being around Jesus was no easy task. It was it was. There was a lot of work, a lot of labor. There was a lot of activity. They were burdened down. <laughs> what, what could we say about the disciples? They, they were drained. They come to Jesus because they were drained. I also think that there's something else in here as well. I uh, I think it's toward the end of my message, but I'll just go ahead and give this the spoiler, and we don't have to wait till the end of the message, okay? Well, let me just go ahead and throw it in here. What about John's disciples? What about them? They're the guy that they followed, the guy that the, they they had lifted up, John. The Baptist, he was a great, I mean, Jesus kind of, Jesus does validate his ministry. He says there's none greater than born among women than John the Baptist. He validates his ministry. But Jesus understands something, doesn't he? It's not going to be long from now that John's going to be beheaded. I don't think Jesus is ignorant of that fact. Jesus looks at the disciples as when he says, come unto me. You know, I think it's also an appeal to John's disciples, come unto me. Because the question would have been, where do we go? Since John has passed off the scene, where do we go? Where do we turn? We follow John with all of our lives. What do we do? Jesus says, come unto me. 
to see those who had come, come to Jesus. And it's this crowd who receives the revelation of God and Christ and stands in opposition to the other crowd. So we have a crowd that is coming unto Jesus, but then there's this other crowd that we find in the middle part of the scriptures. Matthew 11, chapter 7, all the way to verse 24, talks about those and their unbelief. There was a crowd that were gathered about that day, but they only wanted to see, they only wanted to hear, but they didn't believe in Jesus, and they didn't accept Jesus. He even brings it, I mean, he says, from what would you have to say? I mean, you, you acted like you if you, we go out and play our music, we ought to be dancing, and you're upset because we're not dancing. You think that if we just want to uh, play a dirge or something like that, we ought to be mourning, but you're not, well, we're not mourning. You say, uh, John the Baptist came one way. You say, well, you know, he's just, uh, let me read the passage of Scripture. It says, uh, verse 17, it says, And saying, We have piped unto you, you have not danced, we have mourned, you have not lamented. John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He had a devil. I mean, what a, what a sight. And the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and wine but a friend of publicans and sinners, but the wisdom is justified of our children. So you're not here for the right reasons, and you're, you're, you're watching, and you see the very proof of this yourselves. And Jesus would say over and over again, Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but they are they which testify of me. And they see the, they see the full revelation of God and Christ Jesus, and they turn their backs, they reject it. He begins to go out and pronounce these words. I mean, it's just unfathomable in the, in the minds of the people that are gathered around them. When he begins to pronounce these words, woe unto the Chorazin, woe unto the Bethsaida, woe unto the Capernaum. Jesus could do anything. He could do the impossible. But I tell you, they had refused Christ. And he appears and he says, you know, if the works were done in you were done in Sodom and Gomorrah, it would have remained until this day. If it would have been done in Tyre and Sidon, it would have remained until this day. I, what, what a testimony to how we ought to respond to the revelation of, of God. And there's this, this crowd, you know, the one that rejected them, but uh, the, the other crowd, Jesus begins to, to praise the Lord for. The crowd that came unto him, the crowd that found relief in Jesus in verses 25 through 27, Jesus doesn't get disappointed. He doesn't get disillusioned. He doesn't stop because things got hard. What does he do? We, we see a proper response it says, at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent. Who were the wise and prudent? The ones that are standing by and not believing. It's revealed under, under the babes, the ones that were coming. Praise the Lord that people are still getting saved. Praise the Lord that there are people still coming to Jesus. Praise the Lord that people are having their burdens unburdened off of them. I don't know if that's correct English or not, but you get the point. So Jesus praises the Lord. It would be essentially the same thing as the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 1, verses 13 through 18. This Paul is in uh, the, the Roman prison. He's chained on both sides of the guards, and he's still praising the Lord. He says there's some out there that preach Christ of contention, and there's others that are you know, preaching Christ for other reasons. But praise the Lord because Christ is being preached. That's essentially the thought that's coming. There are still people coming. <laughs> Guess what? People can still get saved today. People are still coming today. And so he invites. He invites the people to come. He focuses in on the, uh, in that moment all of his attention on the Father, not on the circumstances. When things get hard, that's what we got to do: focus our attention on the Father. And after the prayer and praise, uh, the rejoicing and the salvation of those who have accepted his revelation, he invites those same ones who have accepted his revelation to come unto him for, for rest. And the longer I live, the more I know how much I need rest. The burdens of this world, sometimes the pressures of this world can seem like a lot, 
I think I thought about a lot about Miss Joyce when her sister was in the hospital and then going through the surgery, and we thought things were well on, you know, going well, and then all of a sudden she passes away. God knew that. But I tell you, that's a burden to you, isn't it, Miss Joyce? Brother James back there in the diverticulitis, something he, he told me, confessed out of his own mouth. This, this will make you feel good, Miss Joyce. He said, I, I didn't know diverticulitis was so bad, but now that I have it, I'm not going to say anything ever again. Praying for Brian's son there, John. Got to see his new car yesterday. Nick and his mother been praying for her, Miss Ann Willis. Burden, rest, we need it. The difficulties and burdens of life can press in on every side, and all the while we try to put on our best face, as I heard this from the lips of uh, Brother Cook. He says, you know, just as a pastor, you kind of got used to the fact when you come to the door and you talk to people and they ask you how you're doing, you say, oh, everything's fine, it's good. I'm, I'm, I'm doing all right. You know, God's still in control. I'm, I'm blessed by the best, is what they say. And the whole while knowing everything's not okay. You put on the smile. You look good. You, you, you put on your, your, your best outward face that you possibly can. But deep down inside, you know those hurts are still there. And God sees it. You might hide it from everybody else. God sees it. Christ knows it. And he invites us to come. Right after Hebrews 3, when Paul called upon uh, the Hebrews to believe his word, he's, he's, he's talking about you know, all through Hebrews chapter 1 and 2, 3, you know, about those who refuse to believe uh, the voice of God, the word of God, the, the promises of God, and that kind of thing. They entered not in because of their unbelief um, is what he talks about. Over in chapter 4, he begins to uh, talk about a rest. Now, there's different rests that he mentions there. Um, but Paul gives the exhortation to enter into God's rest. And I find that kind of interesting because it plays in rather well with our scriptures. But over in Hebrews chapter 4, this is really what I wanted to point out. It says, seeing then that we have the great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. I mean, we must do that. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Yes, it's possible. It's possible to hold on to your faith and walk with these difficulties because God can give you help. He knows the, the, the feelings of our infirmities. He knows the difficulties. He saw, even when we look at John chapter 11, when he looks at his, you know, Mary and Martha who are weeping, he says, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. And he sees the unbelief of the crowds that are all around him. He weeps because of their unbelief. He weeps because of Mary and Martha. He weeps because of his friend Lazarus. really care oh yeah he says over in Matthew chapter 10 after that great evangelistic campaign and knocking on doors he says fear not for you more value than many sparrows yeah we know he cares we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities but was in all points tempted like we are yet without sin let us therefore come boldly here it is Come boldly. Isn't that our command here? Come unto me. Chapter 4, verse 13. What is it? Verse 14, something like that. Verse 15. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. We may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's what we all need, isn't it? To come boldly before the throne of grace. To come boldly to Christ. To come boldly to God. Someone once said, God's not going to give me more than I can bear. You know what I found out? Sometimes there are things in your life that are more than you can bear. If you could bear them, why in the world would you need Jesus? If you could bear them, why, why, why would you need to come boldly before the throne of grace to find help in time of need if you could bear them? The very, the, the, the very fact that we have burdens ought to be the fact that we need to go to somebody who can help us with our burdens. It can relieve it. It brings us unto God. It brings us unto Christ. It has that purpose of bringing us unto him, the one who with, within who nothing is impossible, who can deal with our burdens and can relieve us of those burdens. We 
we, there would never be a reason to go to Jesus. It's outside of Jesus if it weren't for the case. Outside of salvation, that is. However, what we find is there's a call to abide in him, John 15, to rest in him, Matthew 11, to commune with him, 1 John. And as we try to walk out this Christian walk, we need Jesus. And maybe that's why so many people are weary, because we think after we get saved, well, I got this under control. This whole Christian life, I got it figured out. You never express it in those terms, but the more you carry your own burdens, the more that way it looks. Burdens are something we carry every single day. Again, burdens with names of people, burdens with questions similar to what John is dealing with. What are you doing in my life, God? What are you doing with me? What are you doing to me? Why am I here? Kind of burdens. Burdens of the past, burdens of unconfessed sins, all kinds of burdens that are here. A burden, something that uh, a mule would bear. Sometimes those people would load up the burdens upon the packing mules and they'd carry them. Sometimes it refers to a lading of a ship. It could be a load of sin, a load of sorrow, a load of worry, anxiety, depression. It could be remorse. But the great thing is that we don't have to carry all those loads. We just as pastors, we Christians deal with those kind of things. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. I like uh, an illustration I found. Bruce Larson had an unusual way of convincing people to turn their lives over to Christ. He was working in New York City, something Brother Rush would know all about, right? <laughs> uh, not for the New York Times, by the way. But he would walk over... Uh, he walk a man or a woman downtown in front of the RCA building on Fifth Avenue. Do you know where that is? They have this guy named Atlas and a big world upon his shoulders. And I mean, he's just holding it up. And this great big uh, uh, statue, massively proportioned. Uh, again, this, this great big Atlas figure who's supposed to be able to carry the world. But the world looks like such a burden upon him. And it seems barely unable to stand because he's down on his knees trying to lift it up. Larson would say, now that's one way to live, trying to carry the world upon your shoulders. But come across the street with me. He went across the street to the other side over to St. Pat Patrick's Cathedral. And he went over there, and apparently in that cathedral, there's this little boy, Jesus. Not very big at all. And he's holding the world in the palm of his hand. And he said, you have a choice. You can be like that over there and try to bear the world upon your shoulders and be crushed underneath the world. Or you can be over here, come to Jesus, and he can hold your whole world. Whatever is burdening you in your world, he can hold it in his hands, and it's not a big deal to him. And he said this, we have a choice. We can carry the world on our shoulders, or we can say, I give up, Lord. Here's my life. And Jesus said, what shall a prophet a man if he gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? But in Matthew chapter 8, verse 36 uh, well, that's what, to, what shall a man profit? This is the same thing for the Christian life, I guess is what I'm trying to say. We, we can, as a Christian, bear the whole world on our shoulders, or we can come to Jesus. We can come to Christ and say, Lord, here's my burden. Hebrews 12, let us lay aside every weight and sin which does easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that's set before us. Here it is, looking unto Jesus. Again, Jesus is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. John the Baptist came to Jesus with doubts, and Jesus reassured him through demonstrating in real life what the Scriptures said about him. John may have felt like his ministry was nothing. Jesus validates it. He tells him that there is a purpose. There was a time. I'll get to that in just a moment. But if we have these kind of doubts, what I'm saying is that Jesus, Jesus is, uh, Jesus may not do for you what he did for John. In, in this essence, Jesus was on this earth at that point in time. I mean, he could perform those miracles. He could go out and say, go and show John the things you see and hear, the, the, you know, the, the deaf hear, the, you know, the, the, the lame walk, the, the, the blind receive their sight, the poor the gospel was preached unto them. He could say those things there. But it was just a 
reaffirmation of the scriptures. But what we can do is we can find help in the scriptures. It is our authority. It is our, our help. It is our comfort. Anything that's true in our lives has got to come here from the Bible. And that's why I can say uh, we can hold our profession fast, as we said over in Hebrews chapter 4. Yeah, John, he came, he came with those doubts. When Paul came to Jesus, you know, just moving it on uh, down the road here, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul came to Jesus, didn't he? He said this, he said he had a thorn in the flesh, and he dealt with this thorn in the flesh. Three times he went unto the Lord. Three times he got the same answer. You know, my grace is sufficient for thee. In your weakness, I'm strong. John got the reassurance through the scriptures. Paul got the reassurance through God's grace. My grace is enough for you, Paul. Uh, Peter found out in the midst of suffering, he could go to Jesus. He says, casting all your care upon him, for he cared for you. That's where Peter came to for comfort. Folks, you remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount? He said this, uh, if any man would compel you to go with him one mile, what, what should he do? Go with him twain, too. And back in that time, you know, the Romans uh, had this uh, thing because the Jews were under bondage of the Roman government. So if a Roman soldier would come along, this is what he would do. He'd say, yeah. You there, you Jewish man, you carry my load. Go with me a mile, because that's all they were commanded to, to do, you know, at least one mile at a time. And Jesus said, if he commands you, just go a mile. Don't, don't just stop at a mile. Go the extra mile. And what we find out from that is the Roman government just heaped all kinds of burdens upon the people. I find it interesting that Jesus is not that kind of king. He's not that kind of Messiah. He doesn't go upon the Christian and say, hey, you, 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 you keep this commandment. You bear this law. You do this. You do that. And he burdens upon the people. You carry them. You know what our Savior does? Same way he did with the disciples there in the upper room. Takes the towel, takes the lowest position, and washes the disciples' feet. So I came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give my life a ransom unto many. That's our Savior. He didn't come so that the Christian life could be hard. He came to, to, to give you life and that more abundantly. That's what it came to do. And we have a Savior that's coming around, and he wants to bear your burdens. He desires to bear your burdens. He wants to help you. He wants to be more than just. In other words, I guess, Brother James, he doesn't want you just to come to him one time and say, uh, save me, and then I got the rest of my life. Thomas and Sierra, I mean, he wants to help you all of your Christian life. All of your Christian life. Things come up in your life unexpected. You're like, you're scratching your head. I wasn't expecting this. Yeah, but God knew all about it. And just as he proved to John the Baptist, his, God has, his power is enough. If he has power to raise the, the dead. If he has power to heal the lame. If he has power to open up blinded eyes. That's enough. And we're to live in his power. I don't know if you understand that or not. We are to live in his power. We are to live in the vine. We are to live in Christ. We're to walk in Christ. And let him be all sufficient. Thank God, Brother Nick. I, the, the sufficiency doesn't have to be upon me to try to figure out how this is all going to work out. And his timing is perfect. And, and John had this trouble. Why is this going on now? And what is going on? And how am I to comprehend all this? And I, I back up a little bit in my, in my notes here. Uh, chapter 11, and what does it say here? Verse 12, in the days of John the Baptist, until now the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent taken it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, if you would receive it, this is Elias or Elijah, which was to come. And he hath ears to hear, let him hear. John came for a particular time and a particular purpose. And John fulfilled his time and he was living for that time. And John, you did it just right. But you got to understand, just as those words you spoke by and, and, the, and the 
Jordan River where you said, yeah, he must increase when they were all wondering, oh, Jesus is baptizing down the river. Just as you said back then, he must increase and I must decrease. John, now's the time. This is what's going on, John. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto myself. And he's drawing the disciples. He's drawing the impotent. He's drawing people unto himself. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. John the Baptist felt comfortable to come to Jesus with his doubts. The lily multitudes felt comfortable to come to Jesus with their difficulties. The disciples were to feel comfortable to come to Jesus when they were drained from their labors. But we are to feel comfortable in going to Jesus for rest. I want to, you know, just thinking about here for sake of time, but anyway, I want to make this uh, statement because sometimes there's some confusion. I've, I've heard enough preaching on this passage. A lot of preaching is done. And oftentimes, this is what people will do. They want to make this passage mean salvation, and it doesn't. You want to know how I know that? Jesus says, come unto me. Anytime he's talking about salvation, you want to know what he says? Believe. Believe. Believe on me. It's always a belief. That's what he wants them to do. But here he says, come unto me. You want to know how I know it doesn't talk about salvation? It's because of this. He says, I will give you rest. He doesn't say eternal life. He doesn't say salvation. And so it's, he's, not talking about, he's not talking about salvation here, Brother Brian. He's talking about something beyond that. He's talking about coming unto him for his strength and his power. And because of this, we must come to Christ because of our burdens. We must come and take up his yoke that we might know rest for our weary souls. And it's this twofold thing here, coming to him to unburden ourselves and coming to him for rest. Pastor Norman Johnston, he was, he, again, he's now with the Lord. He related this illustration. I take it from him. It was a good illustration. He saw about, uh, he saw this uh, over in Alaska. There was this uh, uh, plane coming down, the bush pilot that was coming down, I guess over a bay or over a lake or something. And he was watching it descend through the air and just kind of watching what it would do as it's coming down over the waters. The nose of the plane was facing toward the, uh, toward the wind and it was coming down and it got to a point where you could tell it was getting ready for the landing. I don't know if it was about 100 feet out or what it was, but all of a sudden he killed, he killed the engine of that plane. And that wind that, that was there began to, 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 to lift it up and to, let it come down lightly and gently and gracefully come down to a landing upon the waters. And it was that wind that lifted them up and sustained them during that time that brought them to that safe landing. And that's what Christ wants to do for us. He wants to be the wind beneath our wings. He's the one by which the Holy Spirit working in and through my life just lifts me up and sets me down very peacefully and helps me even when I'm laden and heavy laden. And um, it's important for us to respond to his invitation, a response to the character of God, a response to his revelation. Without him, John says we could do nothing. Before we can carry out the Great Commission, the Great Commission says this, Go ye therefore into all the world, uh, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Before we can do any teaching, we must come to Christ, as it says here. It's come unto me. What does he say at the end? I got it on two separate pages. It makes it more difficult. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Here it is. Learn of me. Before we teach somebody else, we've got to learn ourselves, don't we? 
Learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart. This is what Paul picked up on when he ministered and planted churches and continued. He found God sustaining rest. He says, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I can say uh, five things here in closing, and this, again, what I think of Christ wants us to do. He says, kind of in a roundabout way, he says this, let me love on you. You have burdens, and you're trying to bear them all by yourself. And some of those burdens can hurt you. Some of those burdens are disappointments. And you need to come to me with those so I can help you, so I can love on you, so I can show you what to do with them. Let me direct you. Let me direct you in my will. And often we fight against God's will when you're in a yoke. What you do is you've got to go together. You can't fight it. You can get nothing done fighting against one another. God says, I have a perfect will for your life. And let me direct you into my perfect will. And it may be hard. But I am the superior uh, oxen, if you will, to help you bear that load. Let me teach you. We need to learn what Jesus wants for our life. He comes alongside of us in our lives and in our labor, and he teaches us what's best and what is right. It's this life of discipleship. When the, Jesus, when the disciples walked with Jesus for these three and a half years and got to know him in such a personal way, and yes, they faced rebuke at times, and yes, they had things out of sorts, that's all part of learning. And it was because they had been with Jesus, we find over the, in Acts chapter, what is it, 5, when the Pharisees took knowledge that they had been with Jesus. Because they had been with Jesus, because they had the Holy Spirit within, that they were able to do so much. It wasn't because of who they were. He says, let me show you. And he shows us how to live the Christian life in a meek and lowly way. You know, a prideful person gets nowhere. Pride comes before destruction, the Holy Spirit before a fall. He says, let me bless you. He wants to bless you and to stretch you and to use you for his glory. And here it is. We're to rest in his work through us. What was his work? His work on the cross. Rest in his work through us, Christ walking in us and through us. Galatians 2.20. One day, a father decided to take his son to the local playground, and he was playing there in the sandbox, as all kids like to do. My children do it. And uh, he, he was just he was a young boy, he was just amazed with sand, running his fingers through it, feeling it, and uh, that kind of thing, seeing all the glistening, different colors, and that kind of thing. But as he was running his hand through, something was in the way, it was a rock, and it, it just really bothered him. He's a young boy, he can't lift up very much, and so he, he tried to get that rock and move it the best that he could. That just took all of his effort to move it out, and, you know, and, and he just couldn't get it out of the sandbox. And he was just felt defeated because of that. He just couldn't, couldn't move it the way that he wanted to. The boy began to, to be upset and sob and that kind of thing. And the father came unto him as he was watching, saw the meltdown that was taking place, and he wanted to just comfort his son in the midst of his trial. And he says this to his son, he says, why didn't you use all the strength available to you to move that rock? You think what a bizarre statement, right? Why didn't you use all the strength available to you to move the rock, and the boy responded the same way you, probably you and I would respond. He said, I did, Daddy. It's just too heavy, and I couldn't move the rock. I couldn't get it. I couldn't move it. It was too much for me. And he says, you didn't. You didn't, son, because you didn't ask me. You didn't ask me to remove the rock, and he took that rock, and he picked it up, threw it out of the sandbox. This is what Christ wants us to do. What's your burden? Because what Christ wants to do, he wants to take that burden and he wants to lift it up and remove it. But you've got to come to him. He wants to unburden you. He wants to give you rest. He wants to help you, but you've got to come unto him. First in salvation, but afterwards, as I said here in the context, as a Christian. As a Christian. We've got to keep coming to him and keep coming to him. And keep coming to him. It may be too much for you, but it's not too much for our God. I hope this message is a help to you. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Are you saved this morning? Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? The one who paid your sin debt on the cross at Calvary. That all your sins might be forgiven in Christ because of what he did. And nothing 
of what we did. We could do nothing to save ourselves. He paid it all. He did it all. And he said, it's finished. And we must come to him for salvation. Come to him that we may know forgiveness and pardon and be accepted into his family and have that life everlasting. Eternal security never goes away. It's always there. You can't lose it. You can't lose it. And that comfort is always there. Number two, I think, I think here this morning, is there a burden that you're carrying? That you say, Pastor, this morning there's a burden that's been on my heart and on my mind, and it's been, uh, it seems like every single day I think about this burden, and it's been going on more than just a few weeks. This has been going on for months now. There's this burden, and it just seems too much for me. And you say, Pastor, if what you're saying is, is true, I need this burden lifted. I want you to pray for me. I need God's help to remove this burden. I want you to understand before, before I ask you to raise your hand and I pray for you, I can't remove that burden. I can come alongside. I can do as Galatians 6 and come alongside, but I can't remove that burden. For, only God can. And you got to go to God for that. Go to God for that unburdening. Go to God for that rest, okay? You say, Pastor, this, this message really hit home. Would you pray for me? Anybody like that this morning? Amen. Amen. Let us go to Jesus. I want to pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this powerful message. I know I needed it personally. And there are burdens that we all deal with day to day. Sometimes it's tears that nobody sees. And we try to put on our best face. And Lord, it's, it's really hard sometimes. And we need you to do what only you can do. Only you can lift the burden of these who are here. The ones who've raised their hands in testimony. To say, God, you need to help me. And God, I pray that you would just move in their lives in a powerful way. I don't know how you're going to unburden their lives. But you do. Help them to live through your power, through your word, and to rejoice in your timing. Help us to look unto the Father, to continually go before the throne of grace that we might find help. Lord, you got to do it because we can. And may you bless not only the message, but we're your people, Lord. And we ask for your help in this. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to sing hymn number 322. And if you just got to pray and you can't sing, that's okay. Just let God work in your heart. We're going to sing hymn number 322, Living for Jesus. 322.
hope that you'll let this message work in your heart. I don't want it to be, as Jeremiah found out, just a sweet song. Oh, Pastor, that sounded so nice and lovely. Let it work in your heart. And if you need me, you know my phone number. You can call me, text me, say, Pastor, I'm going through something. Pray for me. And I will. I do pray for you. And by the way, uh, t- tonight I'll be at the dentist at 5 o'clock getting this crown taken care of. Brother Kuhn will be here preaching for me, grateful for him. And uh, just his great ministry for us. I'm very thankful for always steps up any time that I need them, and uh, different ones of you, you've been a help to me, and a blessing, but anyway, all that to say this, if you need, if you need me to, pray, if you need somebody to talk to, <laughs> that's what I'm here for, okay, Brother Brian, would you mind closing us out in a word of prayer?